there was no mention of the murders. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about the ending of Killers of the Flower Moon. Now, I'm sure a lot of you saw this incredible film and are wondering why it ended with a 1930s radio show. So, I'm going to explain this ending and how it perfectly encapsulates the ongoing story of the Osage and how it fits in with the theme that Martin Scorsese has been obsessed with in his films for decades. Killers of the Flower Moon tells a true story of the Osage murders in the 1920s, and it's based on the David Grant nonfiction book of the same name. Over the course of three devastating hours, we see the white infiltrators on Osage land wantonly murder tribal members for their oil money as they behave like they still live in the Old West. The story centers on the real-life Molly Burkhart and her husband Ernest, who slowly poisoned his wife at the behest of his ringleader uncle, William Hale. Now, the movie pulls an interesting magic trick. It begins with this sweet romance between Molly and Ernest. At least, it's open to interpretation how much they actually love each other by the time the film ends. And Hale begins the movie by praising the Osage. Yeah, Osage are the finest and most beautiful people on God's earth. But as the story goes on, it very slowly becomes clear that not only is Hale behind the murders, but that William is the one who's been pulling the trigger. Throughout the movie's last act, Molly is slowly poisoned and wastes away in front of our eyes. The point of view shifts from the seemingly benevolent white De Niro and DiCaprio to Molly. Molly is helpless in the face of her illness, and the audience is helpless as we watch her waste away. I didn't smoke her to the sky. Wakanda won't know her. <laughs> so the FBI comes to town and convinces William to flip on his uncle. After his uncle's conviction, we are treated to one final scene between Molly and Ernest. Now, I do think that Ernest truly did love Molly in his own way, and I think that Molly loved Ernest, just as the Osage tribal leaders once loved William Hale. Thank you, Mr. Hale. Your friendship has always been greatly appreciated. I'll do anything, anything. And this love is why Molly ends up staying with Ernest so long, way past the point when it would have made sense for her to leave him. So in this scene, Molly really wants to reconcile with Ernest. She wants to believe him. She wants to put their marriage back together. So Ernest tells his side of the story, trying to cast himself as a good guy in all this. I wasn't gonna let him get anywhere near you near you and the children. Huh? Molly wants to believe this story. She fell in love with Ernest, her coyote, but she knows that he has slowly poisoned her for weeks. And this is where Ernest refuses to come clean. Now, Ernest probably never knew what was actually in the injections he was giving her. So from a certain point of view, he's telling the truth. He was told it was insulin and that's what he tells her. What was in the shots? Insulin. But he obviously knew that he was hurting her, but he keeps at this delusion that he was simply his uncle's patsy and had no culpability in his own crimes. And it's significant that this lie is being told by Leonardo DiCaprio, one of the most famous people on the planet. As many commentators have pointed out, it's unlikely this movie would have ever been made if DiCaprio and Scorsese were not attached to the project. So it's significant that Leonardo DiCaprio, the face of this movie, the person who's the ambassador for the film, the best known person in this movie, lies to Molly about her condition. And in return, he's lying to the audience here in the final moments of the film. Ernest is trying to shape this narrative in a way that suits his own needs. Molly doesn't buy it and she leaves the scene. She knows that she can never trust Ernest or his dishonest narrative. And as she leaves the story, we hear the sound of the radio drama. Now that Molly has left the room, it's up to someone else to tell this tale. And the camera lingers on Jesse Plemons' character, FBI agent Tom White. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We go from one dishonest narrator, Ernest, to a slightly less dishonest narrator, a radio drama sponsored by the FBI and Lucky Strike. True Crime Stories has been brought to you through the courtesy of J. Edgar Hoover and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So this is an old timey radio show, complete with a band, actors, and like over the top cartoony folk sound effects. Byron got her drunk and I did the rest. So you have to understand that the Osage murders caused a media frenzy in their time and there were several radio dramas produced like this actual early 1930s broadcast. These true crime stories were like the Netflix true crime documentaries that we're all obsessed with today. The Osage murders were even part of the 1959 Jimmy Stewart film The FBI Story. Now this film was essentially a piece of FBI propaganda that was heavily supported by the head of the FBI J. Edgar Hoover. And that somebody made a mistake. He killed an Indian on government land. The FBI did come to Wade County. And also in 1926, a Native American filmmaker named James Young Deer released a film called The Tragedies of Osage Hills that, according to The Hollywood Reporter, was called the most sensational picture of the age. My point is that there is a history of this exact story being told 
from different points of view. Now, David Grant's original book ends by describing the same Lucky Strike sponsored radio drama, where the FBI promoted themselves as the real heroes of the story and overshadowed the story of the actual Osage tribal members. True Crime Stories has been brought to you through the courtesy of J. Edgar Hoover and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So with this radio drama, we are given a fictionalized version of the fictionalized story that we just saw. The supporting character, played by Jesse Plemons, Tom White, is now the center of attention. This brings to a close the authenticated story of the Osage Indian murders. Now, I haven't listened to the whole drama or read the script, but Katie Rich at Vanity Fair describes this original drama as, quote, a cozy narrative conclusion to one of the last great dramas of the Wild West and bears no resemblance to the story we've just seen unfold. And the book's author, David Grand, went on to tell Vanity Fair, one of the things I tried to underscore in the book was how this history was distorted. And one of the things the Bureau did was they tried to turn this into this big success. And Hoover tried to turn this into a big success after they had apprehended just a few of the killers. But there was a much deeper and darker conspiracy that the Bureau never exposed. In fact, the broadcast itself unintentionally undercuts the FBI's success when they revealed that the white criminals mostly got off with light or reduced or no sentences at all. Doctors, the Shawn brothers, were never pursued by the legal system for having certainly helped poison Molly. The parole board cited his record as a good prisoner for his early release. Even the ringleader, William Hale, ended up outliving Molly Burkhart. Scorsese told GQ the radio show promoted the FBI, and so all of this, all of the tragedy, this catastrophe, ends up as a 20-minute radio show for entertainment. And then, ultimately, as I'm making the picture, I realize, too, that we are making entertainment, in effect. So, Scorsese has always had a fascination with how stories are told, and with how the audience is going to remember those stories. After all, Martin Scorsese is a master storyteller, so it makes sense he would be interested in exploring these themes. Just to cite a few examples from his past work, Taxi Driver ends with the public wildly misunderstanding Travis Bickle's psychotic rampage, and they turn him into a hero. The King of Comedy has a similar ending, with Robert De Niro's failed comedian Rupert Pumpkin being convicted of a crime, but his autobiography sells like hotcakes. Raging Bull ends with Jake LaMotta rehearsing for a monologue where he makes himself seem like a brave, outcast boxer. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody, instead of a bum, which is what I am. Gangs of New York is all about how New Yorkers have forgotten the stories that made our city. Hugo features the films of George Milius being destroyed. Look, I could go on. But Killers of the Flower Moon is Scorsese's sharpest and most self-effacing commentary on storytelling that we've yet seen in his career. Now, the first time I saw this movie, this reminded me of another Scorsese film that ends in front of an audience, The Wolf of Wall Street. Sell me this pen. That movie is another biopic that tells the story of a degenerate stockbroker and a thief named Jordan Belfort. Now, all throughout the movie, we are shocked by the excesses of Jordan's lifestyle, while we're also thinking, gee, I wish I was that rich. And so the movie ends with a get-rich-quick seminar where the real Jordan Belfort introduces his fictional counterpart. Leonardo DiCaprio lectures the audience on how to swindle people out of their money while they hang on his every word. And the final shot is the audience looking at us, making us ask ourselves, why do we find stories like this so interesting. The ending of The Killers of the Flower Moon is very similar. It ends with an audience in the movie serving as a proxy for us, the actual audience. But Wolf of Wall Street was a movie that shamed us for celebrating greed. But Killers of the Flower Moon criticizes the reason we consume these stories about greed. Would I have just watched a three-hour film about a 20th century atrocity if it weren't filled with violence, gangsters, and Leonardo DiCaprio? Now, we should note that a film like Killers of the Flower Moon, even if it is painfully accurate, is not actual history. The true stories of the Osage are in the records and letters and photographs and the other people who lived through this horror. There were hundreds of tribal members massacred during this time and no single movie, even one that's three hours long, could ever do this entire story justice. But this radio play took this story and condensed it into 20 minutes, focusing on the white heroes from the FBI who swept in and saved everyone. And this fictional account takes time for dramatic flourishes like music. <laughs> cartoony sound effects. Light and product placement. Got a lot from my lucky strike. They even make a point to highlight the letters that William wrote that maintained that he was a friend of the Osage. He would write letters back home to his Osage friends. I never had better friends in my life than the Osages. I will be back with you before many moons. But notice the tribal leader is voiced by a white man speaking in a pigden accent. This man, he is being released 
because he paid off politicians. There are no Osage on this stage, and we do not hear Molly's voice. The ending of the movie is acknowledging the movie's own imperfection. Just like the ending of The Wolf of Wall Street, Scorsese is pointing his camera at us once again. He is accusing us and himself of using real suffering to create an entertaining, dramatic story. And that is why he takes the stage at the end of the film, to read the real obituary of Molly Burkhart and to acknowledge how he will always fall short of the truth. She was a full-blood Osage. She was buried in the old cemetery in Grey Horse beside her father, her mother, her sisters, and her daughter. See, Scorsese is a storyteller. To tell stories well, he has to dramatize. He has to cut corners and make assumptions. Like, we don't know what Molly and Ernest said in their private moments, but the screenwriters can make a guess and then put those scenes in the movie. In fact, sometimes, like Ernest, Scorsese is forced to lie by omission. But the problem in our society is we have a tendency to let fiction shape our perception of history. Paul Revere never made that midnight ride he was famous for. He was arrested, like, immediately. The ride was completed by a Jewish man named Israel Bissell. But after Washington Irving wrote a poem with the line, gather around children and you will hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, just like that, that's the truth that we all remember. This is an example of how stories have the power to preserve history or how stories can erase our history. So this perception of fiction becoming history is very problematic when we're dealing with an atrocity like what happened to the Osage. These people were robbed and murdered while the rule of law failed them in every respect. Like this is a black mark on American history, but I likely never would have heard about it if I didn't see it in a $200 million Martin Scorsese film. In fact, Sam Adams writing for Slate even pointed out how this ending was actually foreshadowed by the first scene where Molly and Ernest met. We see these white hucksters trying to con the Osage tribal members out of their money by overcharging them for portraits. For you, sir? $40. For you, sir. $40. How much? Just as, in this movie, Scorsese is acknowledging that he is filming the story of the Osage in part for financial benefit. And that is what makes Scorsese's final monologue so raw and vulnerable. Jack King wrote for British GQ, Scorsese attempts to take responsibility, not only for himself, but for the cinema at large as one of the industry's godfathers. For example, this film seems to criticize the the radio drama for portraying the FBI as the white saviors to the story, but also in the movie we just watched, we cheered when the FBI finally brought the rule of federal law into this community. But Killers of the Flower Moon did show that the Osage tribe had to go to Washington to beg the president for his help. So many Osage are killed for the oil money, please. Now, it is crucial to note that Scorsese's monologue in the film was not part of the actual Lucky Strike radio hour. That show aired in 1933, and Scorsese recounts events that take place long afterwards. The 20-minute retelling focused on the heroic white FBI agent, but Scorsese, delivering a fourth wall breaking monologue to both his proxy audience and us, tells us what really happened to Molly, and how history erased the great tragedy of her life from her story. There was no mention of the murders. And remember, in the final scene between Ernest and his uncle, Hale predicted this would happen. I mean, there might be a, a public outcry for a while, but then you know what happens? People forget. Martin Scorsese uses many tools to tell a story. Cameras, music, actors, and editing. And he's even made quite a few documentaries that do their best to create an entertaining portrait of the real world. But when he takes the stage in these final moments to deliver a simple monologue, he is acknowledging that all of his tools as a filmmaker are imperfect. No film, even Cinema Verite, will ever be able to replace actual history. And that is why the storyteller then fades away into the final voices of the movie, the Osage themselves in a community dance. Remember, the movie opens with the Osage tribal members holding a funeral for a pipe. And this scene, according to Mashable Sid Hantalaka, is actually taken from the novel A Pipe for February by an Osage author named Charles H. Redcorn. And that novel focuses on the Osage murders. So the movie begins with a fictional account that's written from the Osage point of view by an Osage tribal member. And then it shifts to Molly's point of view throughout the movie. And then, as her health fails, we see events through the eyes of Ernest. And finally, the story is told by the filmmaker himself. So then we have this sudden shift back to the real world, back to the real Osage tribe. According to the newspaper The Osage News, the dance was closed to the public and only Osage cast members, Osage crew, and Osage extras that were part of the film were invited, along with their family and friends. What a stunning image to see this community dancing together in an unbroken circle, showing their resilience to racism and bloodshed. It's as if Scorsese is telling us, my part of this story is done, and now we're going to let the actual tribal members tell this story for themselves. Well guys, that's our thoughts on the ending of Killers of the Flower Moon. Let us know your thoughts or if you have any questions down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.